again, appreciate uh, uh, your presence tonight for this class. We're in the present study of logic. We are going to finish tonight and we may finish early, we may finish late, but we're gonna finish. So at this point, uh, we'll need to think about what to study next. And I have a few ideas and you may wanna hang on after the class and we can talk about that. Before we begin though, let's, let's have a short word of prayer. Bow with me, please. Heavenly Father, we appreciate greatly the fact that we as a congregation can gather together through this medium in order to engage in a study of our word. We pray, Father, that each of us may be engaged profitably, that those things they learn may serve them in the kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We pray that all who uh, study thy word will come to a knowledge of what it would have them to do and would render obedience as thou hast directed. Again, we thank thee for uh, the study. We thank thee for Jesus, his sacrifice. And may our loyalty always be to him and his cause. In his name we pray. Amen. I think last time we uh, probably covered this, but I'm going to go through this again because what it didn't cover were the uh, examples uh, that are attached to this particular lesson. So it won't take long to go over this again, but go to it quickly. And we're talking about fallacies. You know, one of the uh, uh, primary purposes of studying logic is to identify fallacies, and you're going to run across fallacies um, not only in uh, religious matters, but secular matters as well. Anyway, so there's uh, different kinds of fallacies, fallacies of distraction, of, of uh, ambiguity, and fallacies of form. So these are uh, uh, what we call informal fallacies. They're they're popular, and uh, despite their popularity, they're invalid and, and or unhelpful. So it's, as the uh, uh, text says, it's kind of like street fighting logic. So you don't engage in a, a formal uh, presentation of what the logic is or uh, how to identify this sort of a street logic, but as we go through it, you'll recognize that you've experienced this time and time again. So these uh, three types of fallacies that we'll cover, they're not uh, no longer Euclidean logic or Aristotelian logic. And uh, we should notice that fallacies of ambiguity uh, be considered distracting. And these uh, categories, you now you can think of some yourself, but these categories are for sake of convenience. And that's what reason you give them terms for convenience sake. They're not for proclaiming a, an absolute authoritative classification. And these fallacies, uh, their fallacies, depending on how they're used, could be that uh, used correctly, they're not fallacies at all, but but it's uh, possible to reason rightly uh, using some of these arguments. Some may consider them fallacies in each and every situation, uh, but human reasoning in, in practice, we take a lot of meaning from the context of the, the conversation. So these are forms of arguments uh, can't be handled as though they were entirely separate from real life situations. So we'll consider first the, uh, some of the uh, fallacies of distraction. Of course, distraction means you're trying to get your focus somewhere else. 
So they uh, point us to information that seems uh, relevant to the conclusion, but they're not relevant. So the attempt is to show how each of the informal fallacies can either be a fallacy or not. So how can we tell the difference? Well, we have to use uh, our little noodle up there. And of course, uh, these fallacies are given names. Usually they're Latin names. First one we cover is Ipsid Dixit. And this is Latin for he has said it himself. You can recognize Dixit in diction. So that's uh, kind of where that word comes from. So this fallacy is committed uh, when an illegitimate appeal is made to authority. You have no right to appeal to that authority. This form takes the, uh, uh, it takes the form of X's, thus and such. And since the X says this and such, it must be the case. And, or if P, P says it, then Q must be. P in fact does say it, therefore Q, you, you'll recognize this as a modus ponens uh, syllogism. It's therefore valid. May not be true, but it's valid. So how can this be valid in the other fallacy? And of course, we must keep in mind that this is, for lack of a better term, just street logic. So the issue is the legit legitimacy of the appeal. Uh, the argument is valid but unsound if the premise is false. If the authority is legitimate and relevant, then there is no fallacy at all. Then if not, it's an instance of Ipsy Dixit. So we can see a case here. Uh, Henry Schwartz says there is no creator, therefore there is no creator. And you can see this is a uh, false because who's Henry Schwartz? Why is he authority on the uh, determining whether or not there's a creator or not? So it's, it's a false uh, premise. But when it's not the Ipsy Dixit, the Bible says God is the creator. Therefore, God is the creator. The Bible is an authoritative source on uh, matters about God. So it's true. It's a true uh, statement. Another type of uh, uh, fallacy is the ad populum. And this means uh, an appeal to the masses, the population, to the population. It makes a, a fallacy. What makes it a fallacy is that the appeal is uh, made to just the mere mass of the uh, population rather than to specific acts, uh, uh, aspects of mankind possessed by the masses to which one may make an legitimate appeal. Uh, when a meal, uh, we know we've seen this uh, time and time again, those of us that are parents, when a pill is uh, such as mom, all my friends are doing it. When that's made, it's a, uh, this fallacy is committed. The ad uh, populum is, the book must be truly great, it's a bestseller. Well, that doesn't make it great. And it's not the hipsy populum. Everyone has found the Bible to be a profitable book. You should read it too. Well, it's true that the Bible is a profitable book. There's no speculation about that, so you should read it. Third type of uh, fallacy is uh, ad baculum. And this uh, fallacy is an appeal to the stick. Ad baculum means to the stick. It's an illegitimate appeal to force. And ad baculum is a thinly veiled threat. 
most of these fallacies are egalitarian in how people uh, treat each other, um, which is expressed in their preferences to have equal opportunities for all, stated in the vernacular, a level playing field. Yet the scriptures tell us that the, the rod is for the back of fools, Proverbs 26, chapter verse 3. In parents properly rearing children appeal ad baculum all the time. And you can see those uh, verses there and, and look those up if you so desire. So the question again comes uh, down to this. Is the authority a legitimate authority? And is the goal of the threat proper? So the ad baculum, if you don't vote for Senator Snout Snuffle, the ozone layer will be destroyed in six months and we will all die. Not one has a relationship to the other. But you're being threatened with death if you don't vote for him. And not the ad baculum is if you do not see the wisdom of our laws against murder, and there, are, there is wisdom there. Perhaps you will be influenced uh, by, or you be influenced by our death penalty, which you may be influenced by that. Fourth one is ad hominem. Uh, this means to the man. Of course, you know in Latin, ad means to something. The hominin means uh, humans. So ad hominin is, ver is verbally attacking a person instead of an argument. Again, this fallacy is not always committed when someone is verbally attacked. All these fallacies must have a hidden value system built into them. The fallacy depends on whether the man being attacked is a bad person or not. Whether his character is good or bad, it's relevant to the argument being made. Is that all relevant? The ad hominem is yes, you know, or we know that you maintain that the sun rises in the east every morning, but we also know that you're a jerk. And of course, the question is, he may be a jerk. What's that got to do with the sun rising in the east every morning? It has nothing to do with it. But you're not taking his word about it because he's a jerk. Now, there may be other things you may question about him, but that's not one you, you can question. So not, not the ad hominem. How can we believe your testimony? You've been convicted of perjury three times in the past two weeks. And of course, you understand this may come up in a trial and it's a legitimate question to ask because it uh, speaks to the character of the, of the person given the testimony. Will he tell the truth or will he not? Boulderism, uh, this is uh, dismissing an argument by simply pointing out why the one presenting their argument came to believe it. This is a fallacy unless the person's reason for adopting the argument is truly relevant to the argument. The name Boulderism comes from an essay by C.S. Lewis in his uh, 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 article or book, God in the Dock, in which he affectionately names this fallacy after an imagine, imaginary Ezekiel Bulver. It is also uh, known as the genetic fallacy, and it usually follows this form. You believe that just because you are a whatever. So I don't need to believe it. So we can say a, a bulverism, you're saying that if it should, 
should be baptized because you grew up in a Catholic home. In a not Wolverism, you are running for Congress as a Democrat today, but yesterday you lost a Republican primary. You were just embracing the Democratic platform because of personal ambition. Number six is uh, to quoque. Uh, this means in essence, yeah, well, you do it too. Uh, one committing this fallacy is pointing out an inconsistency between what his opponent, opponent says and what it, uh, his opponent does, then uses the inconsistency as an excuse to ignore his opponent. The fallacy is not committed, however, when the behavior in question is perfectly fine. So to quote don't tell me I can't smuggle cocaine, you do it too. Well, we know that it's not a legitimate uh, practice to smuggle cocaine, it's unlawful. But not to quote why are you telling me it's wrong to read fiction? You do it too. Reading fiction is uh, nothing wrong with that, depending on what kind of fiction it is, of course. <clears throat> uh, number seven, the ad ignorantium. This is an appeal to lack of information. It's an argument from silence that is no, no one has uh, proven it to be false, so it must be true. So an ad, uh, ignorantium, UFOs must be alien spaceships. The government has never offered any other satisfactory explanation, and I understand Congress is now considering that other explanation. But not ad ignorantium, I remind the jury that my client is innocent until proven guilty. Number eight is uh, chronological snobbery. This fallacy is committed when a position is rejected or affirmed solely based on how old or new it is. Traditionalists commit this fallacy one way and modernists in another. The traditionalist says that it is old and therefore it is good. And the modernist says that it is old and therefore it is bad. Now the passage of time does not establish truth or falsehood for that matter. Although it is an element that may be considered. So chronological snobbery Categorical logic may have worked for Aristotle, but it is outdated now. And not chronological snobbery. I think that we should be more careful when we dismiss something our ancestors have done for centuries. So let's look at uh, some uh, fallacies of uh, distraction, some additional information about it. So most of the fallacies of distraction appeal to some element of fear. Ipsy Dixit appeals to the fear of authority, uh, specifically the fear of what will happen if you ignore or disagree with someone in authority. Ad Populum appeals to the fear of going, uh, going against the crowd of somehow missing out, that is, the fear of peer pressure. Ad uh, baculum appeals to fear broadly, usually fear of pain. Ad hominin appeals to the fear of being labeled as a bad person, either directly or by association with another bad person. Wolverism appeals to the fear of being considered a poor reasoner. Tu quoque appeals to the fear of being considered 
an inconsistent reasoner. Add in ignorantium is not a direct appeal to fear unless it is a fear of being thought of as a person who disbelieves something without good reason. And chronological snobbery appeals to fear of being out of step with the times. Now, Ipsy Dixit is an illegitimate appeal to authority. What then are the characteristics of a legitimate authority? Where do we derive the authority over others? All true authority is derived from God. That's the ultimate authority. Scripture, that is the 66 books comprising the Bible, sets forth his authority as the revealed will of heaven. God has established four authorities to rule in the lives of man, namely civil, family, church, and self. All true authorities, such as the authority of the local police, education, or church governance, are derived from these authorities or some combination thereof. The classic counterexample for ad populum is apparently learned by all mothers of teenagers. The classic response of a mother whose teenager argues, but mom, all my friends are doing it, is if all your friends jumped off the Golden Gate Bridge, and that's a really high bridge, would you jump off the Golden Gate Bridge too? Mo in the, the comic strip Calvin and Hobbes and Lucy in Peanuts uh, regularly appeal to add baculum, uh, the illegitimate appeal to force. Uh, I'm sure that the uh, uh, younger generation have never heard of Calvin and Hobbes or maybe not even Peanuts. The Allies in World War II did not appeal to add baculum on a massive scale because the civil authorities conducting the war were legitimate authorities and their ultimate goal was a proper one, but they certainly were threatening uh, physical harm. Ad hominem is a counterpart to Ipsy Dixit. Generally, Ipsy Dixit follows the pattern X is P, X is good, so P must be true. While ad hominem generally follows the pattern X is P, X is bad, so P must be false. Bulverism and tu quoque are often considered to be species of ad hominem. Someone who commits ad hominem verbally attacks a person in general. With bulverism, the attacker points out the person's source of belief, trying to make it appear that his source is insufficient. With tu quoque, the attacker points out the inconsistency between a person's word and his actions. Ad ignorantium is a part of our legal system. The accused is innocent if they have not proven guilty. Or you can say the, the, the accused is innocent until proven guilty. In our legal system, the statute of limitations is something like a legal version of chronological snobbery. Now, this statute assigns a certain time after which offenses can no longer uh, be legally punished. So let's look at uh, fallacies of ambiguity. Fallacies of distraction always point away from the real issue towards something irrelevant. You know, some fallacies occur not because the information is irrelevant, but because it's ambiguous, vague, or otherwise unclear. And this, these can be called fallacies of ambiguity. One is equivocation. When we use words with more than one definition, we're using them, using them equivocally. In an argument, it is necessary for the terms to retain the same 
definition throughout. That's why it's important in a formal debate to define your terms and use them the same way throughout by both parties. When the meaning of the terms is changed in mid-argument, uh, the fallacy of equivocation is committed. Now, much of humor depends on equivocation, but misunderstandings do also. One could ask a teen teenager, what is the chief end of man, which he could reply, his head, of course. Well, consider the following example. The only rational being is man. Women are not men. This explains why women are, are so irrational. Formerly, this uh, argument appears to be valid, but obviously the word man is used equivocally, first to mean human and then to mean male. Another uh, ambiguity is the accent, or the emphasis, if you want to call it that. In some respects, this is uh, like equivocation. This fallacy is committed when the meaning of a sentence is changed, not through different definitions, but through a different emphasis. Compare the subtle different meanings of the following versions of, we should not steal our neighbor's car. A, we should not, we should not steal our neighbor's car, but it's fine if someone else does. So we put the emphasis, the accent on we. So we should not steal our neighbor's car, but we will anyway. See, we should not steal our neighbor's car, but it's okay if we vandalize it. And indeed, we should not steal our neighbor's car, but the folks across town are fair game. Or E, we should not steal our neighbor's car. We're after the tractor. Note that the fallacy occurs at the point of misunderstanding. A point can often be made through emphasis and no fallacy is made until the sentence is emphasized differently than the speaker intended. Then it, that uh, results in a erroneous conclusion. Number three is amphibole. This fallacy occurs when the grammar of a sentence is such that the sentence is misunderstood. This can occur when someone is being purposely vague. For example, the Oracle of Delphi once told the Greek king uh, Croesus that if he went to war, he would destroy a mighty kingdom. So the king was heartened and went to war only to be defeated. When Croesus complained, he was told that he did destroy a great kingdom, his own. This fallacy is common among newspaper headlines, and you know that quite well. And advertisement too, which in attempt to be brief are unintentionally ambiguous. Uh, one such headline ran, tuna biting off West Washington coast. If someone were to use this as evidence, they that they must grow big fish in those waters, you would be committing the fallacy of, of amphibole. Five is composition. A fallacy of composition occurs when someone uh, assumes that what is true of the parts must be true of the whole. For example, if chlorine is poison, and it is, and sodium is a poison, and it is, then if we combine them in ACL, chemical uh, symbol for, for it. The result should be twice as poisonous, but it's only table salt, something the body needs to survive. So here's another example. Each part of a Boeing 747 airplane is designed to be lightweight. So a 747 must not weigh very much. Obviously what is true about uh, individual components of a 747 is not necessarily true of the whole. Division, this is the opposite of composition. The fallacy of division is made when one assumes what is true of the whole. It's also true of each component. Here's an example. The Lakers are a great basketball team, so each member of the team must be a great 
basketball player. So let's uh, look at some examples. Here's some following examples of ambiguity. Um, mother, you told me not to take, I take any cookies. I didn't take them anywhere. I ate them right here. So that's a fallacy of accent. You know, the meaning of the sentence change, not through different definitions, but through em different emphasis. Um, another one, Kellogg's Frosted Flakes must be nutritious because they are part of this nutritious breakfast. And that's a division because one assumes what's true of the whole is true of each component. Three, my friend said that he hit his head on a rock, breaking it into a million pieces. But I don't think anyone could live with a shattered head. That's an amphibole. The sentence is misunderstood because of the grammar. Four, the teacher said, I instruct you to write a letter to someone and you haven't done it. Said, yes, I did. I wrote the letter A. That's equivocation because the use of words with more than one definition. Number five, Jesus taught we, that we should love our neighbor. So it's okay to hate people across town. That's the accent because the meaning of a sentence changed, not through different definitions, but through a different emphasis. Six, if two teaspoons of sugar make this taste good, then four will make it taste twice as good. That's a fallacy of composition. That assumes what is true of the parts is true of the whole. Seven, bread and water is better than nothing, but nothing is better than a steak dinner. So bread and water is better than a steak dinner. That's equivocation to use word, uh, words with more than one definition. Number eight, that's an expensive dinner. I wonder how much the water costs. Then division, again, one assumes what is true of the whole is true of each component. I read on the front page, number nine, grandmother of eight makes a hole in one, her poor grandchild. That's an amphibole. The sentence is misunderstood because of the grammar. And number 10, Mary had a little lamb. I bet her doctor was surprised. That's equivocation. That's use of words with more than one definition. Let's look at the fallacies of form. Fallacy is a form of arguments with a structural problem. An informal argument can be invalid because of improper form, like a formal argument can. The ways this uh, can happen uh, follow. You can have circular reasoning. One who commits this fallacy is guilty of assuming what must be proved. Uh, one, of the, one of his premises already contains the conclusion, although usually in disguise. So circular reason follows this basic form. P is true, therefore P is true. So suppose you hear someone argue that rock music is better than classical music because classical music is not as good. Bach would uh, not be impressed with this reasoning. She loves me because she says she does and she would not lie to someone she loves, would she? So note that uh, some instances of uh, circular reason are not necessarily fallacious. When trying to defend the truth of our ultimate standards, we find we must reason circularly. For a Christian, the ultimate standard of truth is the Bible. So when a Christian apologist argues that the Bible is true because it, it is from the Bible, as the Bible declares, he is simply demonstrating the Bible to be his absolute standard of truth. An unbelieving scientist May, might also appeal to science to prove that science is true. Now, this merely shows what his ultimate standard is. If, however, that standard is not truly ultimate, then he is guilty of circular reason. So post hoc ergo propter hoc, and this is Latin for after this, therefore because of this, so, so caused, a, caused a false cause. This fallacy is committed by the rooster who believed the sun rose because of his crowing. After all, every morning he crowed, the sun rose. Post hoc thus follows this pattern. P happened before Q, therefore P caused Q. So this is an easy error to fall into, uh, particularly for over simplistic historians. 
the American War for Independence happened after the Renaissance, therefore the Renaissance was one of its causes. It may have been, but chronological sequence itself does not establish the fact. There's the either or, this is the fallacy of oversimplifying the choices, it's also called bifurcation. The one guilty of the fallacy presents a false dilemma, you must believe either this or that. There may be other options, and if there are, this fallacy is present. For example, what, you didn't finish your homework, you must be either stupid or lazy. Well, I'll say there could be other reasons, or both stated alternatives could be true. But the questioner has assumed something that he should not have taken, should have not have uh, uh, made before making his uh, conclusion. And there's the complex question. This is the error committed uh, when the question is framed in such a way that precludes a legitimate response. It's also called a loaded question, for example. I uh, suppose a person was asked, have you stopped beating your wife? To say yes is to commit past guilt, and to say no is to continue unrepentant. This is a fallacy. This fallacy is related to either or. In both cases, something in state, in state has been assumed, which causes a fallacy. The fallacy occurs at the point that an erroneous conclusion is drawn when the question is answered, as shown here. Lawyer, what did you do with the money you stole? Witness, nothing. Lawyer, aha, so you admit stealing the money. A priorism, this is a fallacy of a hasty general, generalization. generalization. And there's two types of uh, a, uh, there's a priorism and there's a fortiorism, which we don't cover here. We have to use the word hasty because generali generalizations can be used legitimately. We call a legitimate general generalization induction. But if the induction is obviously a wild leap into the void, it can be identified as the uh, fallacy of a priorism. For example, this little girl generalizes too quickly. I tried to talk to the new boy, Tommy, yesterday, and he stuck his tongue at it. I mean, boys are so mean. So don't confuse a priorism with composition. Someone who commits a priorism may look at one particular case and fallaciously apply what he sees to the whole, but someone who commits the fallacy of composition looks at all the parts and says that what is true of all of them must be true of the whole. And uh, because of the time, we'll just look at this uh, last one. You can look at the exercises on your own. How do you detect fallacies? And we've seen that fallacy is somewhat, sometimes hard to identify, uh, some more than others. Recognizing fallacies as they occur in daily life can be difficult. It may be in the op-ed section of news sources or so-called reporting of news, especially political news. We see that all the time. You may have read a fallacious argument in letters to the editor or in posts to social media, such as Facebook, Twitter, or next door. Often you say to yourself, that just cannot be true. Or it doesn't pass the smell test or some similar response. Do you wish you could tell what is really going wrong with the comment that elicited your cautious distrust? How do you figure it out? The technique for identifying informal fallacies is the same as identifying any kind of reasoning. There are two questions that must be asked about the person making the argument. What is he trying to prove and how is he trying to prove it? For example, consider this section out of Bertrand Russell's essay entitled, Why I Am Not a Christian. And of course, uh, if you don't know, Russell is a famous atheistic apologist his religion is based, I think, primarily and mainly on fear. It is partly the terror of the unknown and partly, as I have said, the wish to retain that you have kind of an elder brother who will stand by you in all your troubles and disputes. Fear is the basis of the whole thing. Fear of the mysterious, fear of defeat, fear of death. 
Now you have to ask, what is Russell trying to prove? Well, he is trying to prove that Christianity is not true. You, you know, consider the title of the essay. As he's trying to prove that in the above paragraph, we see him attempting to identify the source of Christian faith. Apparently, he thinks if he can say why someone believes Christianity, then it must not be true. Having answered these questions, we can really spot this as an extended bulverism. Uh, well, there's some exercises in identifying fallacies, and, and uh, I'll let you do that on your own because of the time. You can ask yourself two questions, uh, uh, the two questions above, and you, that should guide you in identifying the correct fallacy. And, and just keep in mind that some bad arguments can commit more than one fallacy at a time. Uh, and if you can't decide between two possible fallacies, it may be that both are correct. So we're over time. I uh, ask that uh, everybody stay online afterwards so we can talk about what to do next. Thank you.